Um, so I've just posted argument analysis draft one, the assignment for argument analysis draft one. Hopefully it's pretty straightforward what I'm asking you to do, just in case it wasn't straightforward what you're being asked to do. There's an example with a different sort of a question. Instead of it being about what's the, what's the issue at stake for this like most recent argument analysis? Yeah, it's about eating cheeseburgers, <clears throat> or eating meat in general, we might say. And uh, the example that's given is about whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich. And I look, at, I look at both sides, and then I look at the argument for, like, which of the arguments is the better argument. <coughs> Pardon me, I have a This is weather change. It's getting me. It's like it's, not, it's like a deep, deep cough. Anyway, you guys don't care. Um, I don't... <laughs> I don't really, mm, let me take that back. I care what sort of conclusion you come to in this, but it will not affect my grading. Uh, you will be graded on the basis of whether or not you do like a, a responsible analysis of all of the arguments. So I am not looking for which side you come down on. I'm looking for whether or not you give an honest, thorough, and organized exposition of the key arguments at stake here. Uh, we discussed this in class on Friday, and you have between now and midnight on Friday to get this thing done. It's not very difficult. And since it's an argument analysis draft, those of you who are familiar with the syllabus will know that I'm only grading it on the basis of completion in the first place. But these drafts are things that you might be going back. Well, you'll definitely go back at the end of the semester and pick one of these drafts that you want to work up more. So each one that you do, think to yourself, like, the more seriously I take it, the more work I might be saving my future self. Do you know your future self? Do you care about your future self? I don't know about you guys. Sometimes I screw my future self over. I'm not a very good person to my future self. This may be something to work on. There's an end of the semester you that is going to be very, very angry at present you if you don't take care of business. All right, so we had been looking at likely inferences. We looked at arguments by analogy. This is what got us on this whole cheeseburger problem in the first place. We had an argument by analogy that was working there. Um, and then we looked at moral arguments, which aren't always arguments by analogy, but can be. There are other sorts of moral arguments that we can make. And we discussed some theoretical principles that can be put into play with moral arguments. So this business with moral arguments kind of took us off track just a little bit in talking about likely inferences. We kind of maintained a little bit of a foothold in the way that we were talking about arguments by analogy, which are always likely inferences. Today, we're going to look at two more kinds. We're going to focus on one of them, but we're going to look at two more different sorts of arguments that are inductive arguments, that are likely inferences, inferences that even at their best, they're never going to be certain. And these two arguments that we're going to be looking at are called statistical syllogism. We'll look very briefly at that one. And we'll look at one called enumerative generalization. The worksheet that everybody has is on enumerative generalizations. That's where we'll be focusing. OK. And does everybody have that worksheet? Does anybody not have that worksheet? Good, good, good. All right. Then here we go. A statistical syllogism is maybe one of the easiest sorts of inductive inferences to look at in, in, uh, in the sense that it gives us a very clear idea of what the difference between a deductive and an inductive inference is. For example, uh, let's consider an argument like this one. Most surgeons can successfully remove an inflamed appendix. Dr. Washington is a surgeon, therefore it is reasonable to assume that Dr. Washington can successfully remove an inflamed appendix. Notice what's going on there with that argument. We start out with a big general claim about surgeons being able to remove append append appendices? appendices, being able to remove an appendix if they wanted to, or two, or three. That general claim that I make about surgeons, is it about all the surgeons? No, it's about most of the surgeons, right? If that had been a claim about all of the surgeons, then we would be setting ourselves up for a deductive argument, right? If all the surgeons can remove an appendix, and Dr. Washington's a surgeon, then if those two premises are true, then it is absolutely certain that Dr. Washington's going to be able to remove an appendix. Is that pretty clear? And as soon as we downgrade from all to most, suddenly this becomes a different sort of a beast. We're looking at not certain influ uh, inferences anymore, not uh, the sorts of arguments where we're looking for validity, but we're looking at inductive inferences. We're looking at likely inferences. We're looking at the kinds of inferences where we're going to get strength at best. So this argument asks us to apply some kind of general rule that applies and works most of the time 
And we're expecting that that most of the time is going to be good enough to cover the instances that we want to draw a conclusion about. So, for example, let's take a look at Dr. Washington's scenario. How good of an argument is that? Let's say you need your appendix taken out, and we say, like, let's get Dr. Washington to do it. And you're like, I don't know, can he do it? And we say, most surgeons can do it, and Dr. Washington's a surgeon. Are you satisfied? You say, sharpen up the scalpels, get to work, Dr. Washington. What do you want to ask him? If he can do the, if he can do the, yeah, if he is, well, he's obviously not most surgeons, right? Because he's only one surgeon. But um, is he, is he like most surgeons? Yeah. And we say, Dr. Washington, will you be able to perform this surgery? And Dr. Washington says, most of the time that I perform the surgery, it goes well. Yeah, what does that mean? It's a little vague, isn't it? Like what would you like sharpened up? Is it surgery that's vague? Yeah. Is it successfully that's vague? It's just like Perhaps. most of the time, because most of the time could mean 51%, 49 exactly. 51% success rate. Most is vague, right? Yeah, and we're back, at, we're back in maybe some familiar territory. We have a qualitative, sorry, a quantitative question. Let's get that right. We have a quantitative question that comes along with every single likely inference that kind of trades on this idea of there's something like like a most. There's some kind of a most of the time sort of function in any sort of inductive inference. And we want to know, what does that mean? How mosty is the most there? 51% of the time? A surgeon with a 51% success rate on, maybe it depends on the surgery, on an appendectomy, is that good? No, that's actually quite bad. And if we say most surgeons can do it, and we meant 51% of surgeons can do it, are we going to be able to proceed from that knowledge to Dr. Washington's a surgeon, therefore he probably can do it? And again, we're also like in this territory where we're wondering to ourselves, well, what's on the line, right? If this was, oh, I don't know, if this was a gambling scenario, if we were doing a fair coin flip and we said most of the time that coin comes up heads, like 51% of the time, that might be enough of an edge to get me to be like, all right, let's do this. Let's flip this coin. I'm going to call heads every single time. I'll lose sometimes, but I'll win more often than I lose, and that's going to be a smart sort of a gamble for me. But if it's an appendectomy, one loss means, it means I could die, right? So this is maybe a problem. Let's, uh, instead of most surgeons, let's go ahead and sharpen that up a little bit. Uh, let's say 99% of surgeons can perform an appendectomy successfully. And Dr. Washington's a surgeon. Good enough? And let's keep in mind, too, that we're, if we're wondering, like, oh, if he gets it wrong, I'll die, we might also say something like, if you don't get anybody to perform this surgery, you're probably going to die as well, right? Your appendix will rupture, and you'll, you'll get very, very sick, and then you'll die. So I don't know. 99% of surgeons can do it. Dr. Washington's a surgeon. Therefore, Dr. Washington can probably do it. Satisfied with that? Maybe we want more information? We wanted to clarify it before when I said most. You're like, whoa, how mosty is most? What else do we want clarified? Yeah, uh, Gordon. Uh, there's sort of an implication in 99% that that 1% of times that it goes wrong there's like some strenuous effort that goes into it. That's an like excellent point, yeah. Yeah, so it's not just 99% of the time it goes well. We want to know, like, is there some sort of pattern within the pattern? That 1% that goes poorly, is there some sort of pattern in that that tells us that these are the exceptions to the rule? 99% of the time, surgeons can perform an appendectomy. That's the rule. It's not something that applies all the time. There are exceptions. Is there a rule to the exceptions as well? Perhaps we would notice that, hey, you know what? That 1% that can't do an appendectomy, they are predominantly oral surgeons and plastic surgeons. Now we have a question for Dr. Washington. What kind of surgeon are you? Yeah. Are you an oral surgeon? Oh, the ones that like overwhelmingly can't do an appendectomy? Okay. This is good to know. Did you have to, that was what you were going to say as well? Anything else on the line here? This is like we're getting it pretty good, I, I think. Let's look at another example. Studies have shown that roughly 95% of liars are miserable people. Those are real studies, by the way. Um, Stephen is a known habitual liar. I think we can safely conclude that Stephen is a miserable person. We're a little more specific than most here. We say 95% of the time. We're going to conclude that Stephen's a miserable person 
maybe 95% chance of being right is good enough to take a chance on this. And again, we want to know something like, with the surgeon example, is there some sort of pattern within the pattern? The 5% of liars who are not miserable people, do they all have something in common that tells us that there's a rule to, the ex to what counts as an exception to the rule? For example, the 5% of habitual liars that are not miserable people are all psychopaths. And Stephen's a psychopath too, so oh, now there's good reason to think that he doesn't fit the rule. Does this make sense? Shall we look at one more example? The vast majority of students who do well in philosophy classes go on to lead rich and fulfilling lives. These are all real statistics that I did not totally make up before class. It stands to reason that if I do well in my philosophy class, then I will go on to lead a rich and fulfilling life. And what are our questions? This is not intended to like, be new or challenging. We're just rehearsing what we've already established here. How well is doing well? Yeah, we might want to know how Will is doing well. We might want to know what counts as a rich and fulfilling life. We might want to know what else? It's the same things as before, guys. Vast majority. Yeah, vast majority is a little vague. I want to know what counts as a vast majority. I also maybe want to know, is there a pattern within the pattern, right? Is there an exception to the rule? I want to know if there's a pattern within the pattern and if the exception to the rule has a rule of its own. And last but not least, I want to know, is it worth it? I'm not going to be certain about this. This is always going to be a little bit of a leap. This is a likely inference at best. Is it worth it to take the chance on it? Sort of argument. Blah, blah, blah. All right, so we can undermine this in a couple of ways. One, we can show that like, the pattern is not very robust. And we can show that either by saying the most isn't very mosty or we can point out that there's an exception to the rule and there's a pattern. There's a rule to the exception to the rule. And we have good reason to believe that the case at stake, the case in question, is something that doesn't fit the rule. It actually fits the exception. Good so far? And again, this is just like analogical induction in that we've got a quantitative issue. That's the like how mosty is most. Is it 51% of the time? Is it 99% of the time? We have a qualitative issue. Is the rule that's being applied actually relevant to the case that I'm applying it to? Is the case that I'm applying it to something that fits the rule better, or is it something that fits the exceptions to the rule better? And then last but not least, is it worth it to take a chance on maybe? All right, that's statistical syllogism. Pretty straightforward, pretty nice as a contrast against deductive arguments that are working from general rules that start with an all, right? All surgeons can do the surgery. All dogs are mammals. Once I start like that, I'm setting myself up for a deductive argument. But how often do I get an all premise like that, right? All dogs are mammals. That one's true by definition, right? If I found a dog that like, was hairless and didn't give birth to live young, and the mothers didn't feed their young milk from their own bodies, would I just say, like, oh, well, shit, that's just not a dog then? Or would I be like, oh, this is an exceptional dog. This is a non-mammal dog. Or would I be like, no, nah, that's an alligator. Yes? Well, if it's still considered a dog, isn't it, wouldn't it be a mammal? So if you start calling it a dog, it wouldn't be a mammal. Yeah, if I was calling it a dog, then it'd have to, maybe it would be a brand new kind of mammal that has completely different properties than other mammals, right? I said, yeah, what did I say? Doesn't have any hair, doesn't give birth to live young, doesn't feed the, the young milk. We'd say, like, it's a dog, so I guess it has to be a mammal. Now we're not so sure if all mammals do those three things, right? Okay. Cool, cool. Here's something that's a little bit different. And one way to think about this, in contrast to the statistical syllogism that we just learned and completely mastered, is that the statistical syllogism starts off with a general rule. Where do those rules come from? How do we get those rules? How do I get to the point where I say most surgeons can perform an appendectomy? I go and I ask every single surgeon. Do I have to ask every single surgeon if they can perform an appendectomy before I can say most surgeons can do an appendectomy? I just need a repre representative sample, and then I can generalize from that. Oh, yeah. And whenever I do that, I'm making a likely inference as well. And there are ways of doing this well and responsibly. There are ways of doing this poorly. These sorts of arguments we'll call enumerative generalizations. Sometimes we'll just call them generalizations or inductive generalizations. And 
The name pretty much says exactly what this argument does. It enumerates a whole bunch of cases, and those cases fit a pattern, and we go, all right, so therefore the pattern, most of the time, all of the time, we might be real bold and say, therefore all of the time. That's a really, really big time generalization. You can soften a little bit and say most of the time, but either way, what you're banking on is this idea that the pattern that you've observed so far in the sample that you have before you is somehow representative of the entire population that you're generalizing to. So, for example, let's say John saw a raven and it was black. Sally saw a raven. It was black. Who else saw ravens here? Reggie saw a raven. It was black. I saw ten ravens. They were all black. Therefore, all ravens are black. Is this enough for me to say all ravens are black? Can I ever say that all ravens are black? Is that just, a, just like a crazy thing? If anybody was to say all ravens are black, you'd be like, come on, man, you're, you can't be certain about that. What if they came back and said, I don't need to be certain. I just need to have good reason to believe it. Can I have good reason to believe that all ravens are black on this basis? John saw one, Sally saw one, Reggie saw one, I saw ten. How many ravens is that? Thirteen ravens. Thirteen ravens, therefore all the ravens. How many ravens are there? A lot. A lot? Like more than thirteen? Like fourteen? Fifteen? At least, yeah, at least twenty ravens. Maybe like at least twenty million ravens, right? There are lots and lots of ravens. Thirteen is not going to be enough to generalize from. Maybe. Maybe not. How many ravens would I need to see? If I saw 13,000 ravens, would we say that I had a stronger basis to say that all ravens are black? Argument's getting stronger. Strong enough to be strong? Not just stronger, but strong. Kind of like I can, be, I can beat my sister in arm wrestling and be like, I'm stronger, but I don't know if that makes me strong. 13,000 ravens, good enough to go by? What if I told you that it was 13,000 ravens and we saw them all in Guilford County? Now are you like, ooh, ah, uh, ooh, uh, 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 what's wrong now? My sampling method was bad? Because it was all limited to Guilford County? I have good reason to believe now that most or possibly all of the ravens in Guilford County are black. But I haven't been outside of Guilford County. I don't know if there are white ravens someplace else. Right? This was actually a really, really big deal in medieval, like amongst medieval logicians. They were convinced that like, it's got to be reasonable to say that all swans are white because all the swans that anybody's ever seen have always been white. And they kind of you know, puzzled this, this out. They're like, how can we get to this point where we can say like, with any sort of certainty that all swans are white? And it turned out that they just had never been to New Zealand where there are, in fact, black swans. So not only could they not prove that all swans were white, it was just not true that all swans were white. Yeah? It seems like this is kind of the basis for a lot of like, scientific research almost trying to find these like, generalizations and then trying to yep. prove that it's the rule. Yep, this, is, this ability to make rules from cases that we're looking at is basically how we interpret data to come up with some sort of like, meaningful claim that I can make from the data. Let's take a look at one, at least one more example. Every time I've encountered, yeah, this one's maybe a little too much information for you guys, but every time I've encountered poison ivy so far, I've broken out in a horrible, itchy, and painful rash. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that whenever I encounter poison ivy, I will break out in a rash. How strong is that argument? And maybe, just like the other ones that we've seen so far, we might say, like, don't know yet. Can we clarify some stuff? What would you like clarified? I'm right here. I'm happy to tell you everything about my skin. How many times? Yeah, so I say every time I've encountered poison ivy so far, like once, if it happened once, then I could still say every time, right? So what if I said every summer for the last 10 years? Good enough? Yeah, what if I said just last summer, that's the only time I've ever encountered it? You'd be like, not good enough. Okay. Anything else you'd like some clarification on before you could say for sure whether you think this is worth taking a chance on and believing. Yep. Was the poison ivy always found in the same place? Was the poison ivy always found in the same Yeah, so maybe it was always in the Smokies, right? And, uh, but I've never encountered poison ivy someplace else. Or maybe I did, uh, I did say every time. So yeah, maybe I've never been outside of Appalachia. So I don't know if it's fair to say 
whenever I encounter poison ivy, maybe I would specify whenever I encounter poison ivy in Appalachia. Yes. What does encounter mean? Yeah, did I like, did I spy it from like across the trail? Did I go and shake hands with it and say, nice to meet you, Poison Ivy? Did I not have any toilet paper with me on my hike and I like use the Poison Ivy? That's a pretty close and an intimate encounter. Did I eat it? Did I smoke it? Yeah, what counts as an encounter here, right? Fair enough, yeah. Shall I clarify that? I don't know. For my money, like an encounter is like something better than I spotted it. It's I walked through. I walked through and I possibly touched it. I think I might have touched it. That'll count as an encounter. Yes. Is it the only thing I yeah, maybe is it the only like there's a pattern to my rash and it has to do with encountering poison ivy. It might be that there are other patterns as well. I might point out that like you might ask yourself, like, well, where are you encountering all this poison ivy? And I say, always out when I'm hiking. It's the damnedest thing. And you might say, what else do you do when you hike? And I say, I bring my backpack every time I hike. And, like, here's all the stuff in my backpack. Here's this, uh, here's this bandana that I always wear. Here's some trail mix. Here's the sunscreen that I always use. Like, I only use it when I go hiking, and I always use it when I go hiking. And you might say to yourself, like, whoa, 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 back up, back up. Tell me more about the sunscreen. You always use it when you go hiking? And you only use it when you go hiking? Were you using it every time you got the rash? Were you using it every time you encountered the poison ivy? In which case, now we have a conflating variable here, right? You could say, like, maybe it's the poison ivy that's causing the rash. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's the sunscreen. Yeah. Or it could, be, it could have been poison sumac every single time. I don't know. Right? So yeah, this is, uh, I don't know. What do you, if, if, this was, if this was you, and you were wondering, like, should I go on this hike? Would you say, like, I'm, I'm not doing it. It's just not, it's not worth it to take the chance. Would you just stay out of the woods if every time for the last 10 summers that you went hiking, you got a poison ivy rash? And we could rule out things like, was it always this weird, like, dollar store sunscreen? Maybe that's what's causing the rash. We said, no, but it's a different sunscreen every time. You're not encountering any other different plants. You've been all over the world. It's not just Appalachia. Do you have enough evidence now where like, you could say, like, I'm just not going on any more hikes? And if people were like, you're being unreasonable, you'd be like, bullshit. Here's my argument. It is entirely reasonable for me to stay out of the woods now. Yeah. If it was just a little patch on your arm, then you could get over it? Do any of you guys get, like, have strong reactions to poison ivy? I never get, like, just a little patch on my arm. If I get, like, a little bit, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's awful. It's awful. And the first time that, like, I thought I encountered some on a hike with my wife, and I was, like, freaking out. I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. She was just like, you're being such a baby. And then about five days later, for the next two weeks, I was just, like, this disgusting, oozing, scabby mess. And she was like, all right, I get it. <laughs> then maybe, this is this kind of what's on the line question, right? You're like, ah, take a chance. What's the worst that happens? You get a little red itchy spot? Like, no, no, I have to like, I have to take oatmeal baths for a week. Yeah. I feel like if you've gone for the past 10 summers, though, you've gotten over the rash. You were able to get over the rash. Do I look like I got over it? I'm freaking out here, man. <laughs> Yeah, and eventually I bounced back, but it was like miserable the whole time. Now maybe we might say something like, couldn't you go on the hike and just get better at spotting the poison ivy? Can't you just wear some long pants and as soon as you get back to the car, take them off, put them in a plastic bag? Yeah, maybe. Maybe there are other ways around it. All right, I, all right fair. Fair enough. But either way, like what we're trying to establish here is whether or not there's a pattern, right? There's a pattern that says, like, every time I encounter the poison ivy, I get the rash. And it seems like there's enough evidence in what I've described. There's enough evidence that, that says, like, if Rosenfeld encounters it, depending on what we mean by encounter, if Rosenfeld encounters it, he's probably going to... I swear, I think it might be psychosomatic, too. I've seen other people with poison ivy rashes and, like, didn't even touch them. Didn't go hiking at all. They went hiking and then came back, and I was like, what's that on your arm? Oh, it's some poison ivy. Five days later, I got the poison ivy. 
It's like an infectious idea. That's probably, I've had dermatologists tell me there's no way that's true, man. There's got to be something else going on. All right, in the past, whenever I've dropped something, it's fallen. Therefore, it's probably true that if I drop something, it will fall. You can test it out now. We can test it as many times as we like. Pretty strong? Pretty strong. Certain? No. Not certain. Not certain. But as close to certainty as an inductive argument is likely to get. Fair enough? OK. So in order for this sort of argument to be strong, we've got our same little trio of, of questions. We have some kind of quantitative question that says something like, if I'm making a generalization from cases, I want to know that there are lots of cases. If it's just a few cases, if I saw 13 ravens, that's not enough to talk about all ravens. More ravens, the better. The more cases that I'm generalizing from, the stronger this argument's going to be. And it's not just a numerical quantitative issue. I have some qualitative questions as well that would say thing that would ask, ask me to identify whether or not the sample that I have is not only large, but representative is the way that we usually talk about this in statistics. The sample needs to not just be large, but representative of the target population. No sampling biases, no, no good reason to believe that the rule that I'm observing has major exceptions that I just haven't identified yet. For example, the rule about black ravens only applies to Guilford County. The rule about Adam's rash only applies to times that I encounter poison ivy when I'm also wearing the dollar store sunscreen, et cetera, et cetera. Does this make sense? And then last but not least, this question of whether or not it's worth it to take a chance on probably right. That's always going to be bouncing around for any inductive argument. <clears throat> Questions about statistical syllogisms? about enumerative generalizations. Let's practice with some enumerative generalizations. We've got a worksheet. <coughs> and for the first time, I think, all semester, we've got enough time to finish the worksheet in class. So that's exciting. Um, shall we go through them one by one, or should we let everybody try to finish it on their own and then go over it as a class? Which would you prefer? On your own? All right. Let's take about five minutes, and then I'll check in. And folks who are doing all right and maybe want to leave early can leave early. Folks who want to stick around and ask more questions can do that.